Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are today, and it is then posted onto our website for you to watch at your convenience. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think who may be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, um, and this is for all types of libraries across the state. So uh, you will find uh, shows on, on, our, on our upcoming shows and in our archives on Encompass Live that are for publics, academics, K-12, um, university schools, corrections, museums, um, anything that is a library or has a library in it. Uh, potentially uh, we, we cover. We're, so we're very, very broad um, with what we um, have on, on the show. Uh, you should be able to find something for anyone. And we do a mixture of things here, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, uh, just anything and everything that has to do with libraries. Uh, we do sometimes have sessions that are done, presented by Nebraska Library Commission staff uh, for things and services and programs and things we do here um, through the state. Um, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. Um, on the line with us is uh, Megan, and you know what? I didn't ask about pronouncing your last name. Oh, it's a Shad tricky one. Shadlick. Shadlick. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And she is the creator of The Healing Library, which I've been investigating that. It sounds like a really cool resource. Um, I'm not going to say anything about it because I'm going to have her tell you all about it <laughs> today. And and you are in... Um, Signal Mountain, Tennessee. Tennessee. That's what I thought, Tennessee, right. And when we did uh, a little while ago, we did a... We do a test with these, with everyone who's going to come online to tech test, make sure everything works. And it was actually snowing. Oh, it was so great. <laughs> How was it today? I see you're wearing t-shirt again, short sleeves. I, yeah, back in t-shirts. Um, it's kind of rainy. You know, we had those terrible storms that hit Nashville uh, yeah. yesterday, and so we were on the tail end of that, but luckily didn't have anything like that happen here. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear you're, you're good and safe there. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm just going to hand over to you to tell us about the Healing Library. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to be able to see the chat feature, but I do have a tendency to get carried away and excited. If you have a question, um, just shoot it to Krista or put it in that chat box. And between the two of us, we'll see it and we'll get to you. Yep. Uh, so first, I want to thank everybody, you know, Nebraska Library Commission and Encompass Live for having us on today. If you're a Twitter person or a Facebook person, you can follow them. You can tweet at um, NLC News or use the hashtag Encomp Live to talk about the show specifically. And as for me, hi, I no longer have that hair. As you can tell, I kind of miss it. But uh, <laughs> my background is I'm the creator of the Healing Library. I'm also the author of a book through ABC Clio called Cooking Up Programs Teens and Tweens Will Love, Recipes for Success. I've been a public librarian um, in three different libraries at three sizes in three very different states for about 13 years now. And I mentioned this because uh, when Chris and I were talking about me putting this together for everyone, we decided it would be really great to sort of focus on our rural libraries, focus on our smaller libraries. So just to give you a little background, my first library, um, we were in a ski resort town. And so typically our population was about 1,300 people. But in the winter, depending on you know which holiday weekend it was, the population could bump up to about 20,000. Uh, after that, I moved to Maine, where we were a part of a joint library system spanning a river in Lewiston, Maine and Auburn, and we had about 59,000 residents combined. And then finally, I wound up working in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where our population is about 179,000, and we had uh, four branches, and they've just added their fifth, which is pretty cool. If you want to talk specifically about me or my you know, changes in hair or whatever, um, I am Bibli, the project itself, the Twitter handle is Library Healing, or you can just do the Healing Library hashtag if that suits your needs better. 
So what we're going to cover today, really quickly, because I want to leave plenty of time for people to ask questions, troubleshoot together, and share our own resources, is we're going to go over an introduction of what the kits are, how the kits came to be, what's inside the kits, a little bit about social emotional learning um, to give you a background of the science behind what we're creating. And um, then we're gonna move into how to download these or purchase them and get started on your own, whatever works for you. And then my favorite part, we're gonna go over common concerns and of course, solutions to those concerns. So an introduction to what the healing library is. Uh, our goal was to create kits for families that have experienced trauma or are experiencing trauma or life-changing events to assist them in creating a unique journey of their own based in social emotional learning and healing. Four kits have been uh, developed so far to uh, assist these families with their journey. Our four topics thus far are Alzheimer's in your family, the death of a pet, the death of a loved one, and finally, separation and divorce. So we're gonna have a quick poll just to sort of figure out who's in the room, where we stand as a community um, large at large. So if you could choose um, one through four of which, who here feels that their community would benefit from one of these kits? And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Krista, but I believe people can choose more than one option. Um, yes, sure. Okay. Um, Oh, go ahead and type into the question section there because uh, it looks like our polls are not coming up. Maybe that's another oh. thing about monkey with this. That's okay. We can do this manually. It's not a problem. Yeah, and it might actually be because I can't see the questions. If you want to, if folks wanted to put um, one through four in the chat, you can choose more than one. I'll be able yeah. to see what you're typing. Yeah, go ahead and type into the question section of your interface and just type in any of the numbers one two three four you can do multiple ones if you want to um and see um what we get so definitely get typed into there about open up questions on your interface and i'm going to see if i can figure out behind the scenes here as i'm working on this what happened with our yeah today's session went a little weird but that's okay we always have backups it's okay <laughs> yeah it is okay yeah. All right. And so actually, we're getting... every time I click the chat, it's bumping me out. Yeah. All right. So we've got Go three, four, uh, four, four. We've been with three closely following. Looks like threes and fours are. Um, I mean, some are saying anything would be, but um, yeah. Three, four, 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 three, three and four. One of your other one of these libraries has these kits. All of them. One and three. One, three, and four are coming up. Three and four the most. Two, not wow. so much. So that's that's pretty yeah. typical of what I find when I ask. I mean, mm -hmm. going out to a bar together after a conference session and just chatting with people. When I run a webinar, when I actually do face-to-face -face trainings with people, typically what we find is that uh, number three has the largest response. Um, number four and number two tend to be neck and neck, and typically number one is trailing. Um, but it just goes to show that we're we're sort of Again, it proves all in the same boat. Um, so beyond that, who here feels intimidated or occasionally overwhelmed by the role of therapist that has tended to creep more and more into our job description as librarians lately? Um, same thing, you can choose any of these and one would be holy smokes, yes, I need a nap. Two is nap piece of cake and three is actually I am a therapist, I got this. Yeah, so go ahead and uh, type again into your question section there. And let us know where you are. Let's see here. Did you raise your hands? All right. <laughs> uh, we're getting a lot of one, 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 one. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. okay, now we're getting some other people. Yes, yeah. somewhere between holy smokes and cake. Okay, so that's not, uh, no intimidation here from one person. It's more or less part of the job. Oh, oh that's good. Yeah. Um, so I think we're leaning towards the, yeah, the first choice there. Holy smokes. Yes, I need a nap. Actually, my my screen. 
and someone else is somewhere between also between holy smokes and oh, yeah Bay i'm Bay. actually hold on a Okay, so again, typically we find, oops, we find a lot of people saying, number one, that it's a little bit intimidating. Those of us who have been, you know, maybe doing it for a while or new coming into this, that we were going to be essentially social servants for, for all of these things feel a little more comfortable. Um, mm. But it's, it's good to sort of get a bearing and be honest with yourself about oh, where this work falls in line with you and with your comfort. So the creation of the kits, um, the, the very short version of the origin story is that it started while I was in grad school. I got my I, um, MLIS from Syracuse and I wanted to create something and give back instead of just taking and learning. So I started this project based off of um, Arthur Levine, who's the man that the US has to thank for Harry Potter coming here, had created a beautiful, brilliant picture book called What a Beautiful Morning about loosely about his family's experience with um, a member of their family getting Alzheimer's and how they reacted to that. Uh, I, um, a friend of mine, Kirsten Cappy, who runs Curious City, had created a how to have a conversation with your child around this or how to dive deeper into this book as a family kind of one pager. And I was so inspired by that, that I had been toying with this, this idea of wellness and healing and how does it tie into the maker movement I've always had a passion for non-traditional lending and um, a newfound appreciation for design thinking over the past, uh, before that it had probably been about two or three years that I was really passionate about that and had the, the framework and language to understand what I was doing. So it all sort of came together for me when Kristen put out um, that one pager that I wanted to take my own experience of healing and what I had learned about that and to, to really dive deep and provide something for families that could assist them. Once Kirsten and I talked about this and decided, yes, this is something powerful, we knew that we had to assemble just a crack team of the best possible people we could find to get involved. So these are some silly pictures, but the upper left with the giraffe is Kirsten Cappy, who runs Curious City, as well as I'm Your Neighbor Books now. Um, link to her site there. If you aren't already, sign up for her mailing list because she has incredible giveaways. Uh, she creates these uh, story time kits and experiential marketing pieces for high quality, diverse, typically independent published picture books that are outstanding. Uh, next to her is Bonnie Thomas, who is a licensed clinical social worker and a friend that I had made while I was living in Maine. And finally, I involved David Moorhead from the Lewiston Maine Public Library. He's actually just retired because he was critical in building my love of non-traditional lending when I worked with him in Lewiston, Maine. So inside the kit, Oh, whoops. Okay, Megan, sorry, things got, okay. whoop, the audio just got cut off there. Sorry, that's okay. okay. <laughs> sorry about that. I was like, I'm just going to keep talking. We'll see what oh, happens. That's all right. Yep, it's back now. Now, we had a comment that came in, actually, um, about your, your choices before that, um, what about being a good listener um, of where you're in between of, you know, how do you feel as being not necessarily a therapist, therapist, but just oh. letting them talk and, but it is still intimidating, they say. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because it is. I think um, engaged listening and active listening is such a big part of what we do. Um, and actually the, the kids talk about that a little bit at the end. And so we're, we're gonna circle back to that. So whoever said that, thank you for the transition. <laughs> um, so at the moment, we're gonna go ahead and open these kits up and show you some of the contents of okay. what is um, it. It looks like your, um, your camera has frozen too. Your camera picture, your webcam picture has okay. frozen up, which is okay. Just can Give me a second here. Un Is that bad? Do, do. If you try to unshare it and reshare it, it might reset. Yeah, let's just see. Yeah. Just get it back there. How's that? Instead of a static page or a static picture. Any better? Yeah, it's oh, it's not sharing it now. I mean, it's sharing too, but it's giving a blank a blank picture. Oh, that's so sure. weird. I'll do it one more time and 
Yeah, and if it doesn't, that's fine. We can go with just the slides. It's all good. Okay, mine says I'm back in. Yeah. Sharing. I can see the box for your camera, but there's no picture coming through. That's okay. We just will sure. um, go on to just doing the slides instead. Not a problem. Sorry for the yeah. awkward freeze yeah. of my face, everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Girl. I'm just going to jump back in then. Okay. Audio is good though, right? Yeah, the audio is fine now. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So let's go ahead and open the kits up. So first up, we have a guide that we created for librarians. And so this has how to build your kit out if you want to do that from scratch and how to stock your kits after they've been returned. One of the beautiful things about the Healing Library and that designer um, design thinking piece that I mentioned is user-based design. And so we really encouraged people with these handouts that if they resonated with a particular page or a book discussion guide to pull those papers out and keep them when they return the kit. And then we as librarians would restock it and send it out again with the next family. Uh, there are time lending suggestions for your circulation. The goal of the kits is clearly stated so that staff members don't feel that by carrying this, you've taken on that role of therapist. Uh, there are tips for designing your own materials if you wanted to enhance this kit with something. You know, maybe you have some sort of sensory story time that would be impactful and you want to create that to add to the kit. We have all of the logos and fonts and the size of everything that we used available to you. And then finally, how to supplement your kit with local materials, which we will get to. Next is a welcome guide for the families themselves. And this just sort of in a one pager goes over what's inside this kit that you've just brought home with you and what the kit is. Specifically that it's a start to their own healing journey, but not a complete healing experience. Next, we have an overall discussion guide for each of these tricky, tough topics. And it goes over how to approach these difficult subjects with the child. Common mistakes to avoid, such as if your pet has passed away and you're not a family that believes in heaven, say, uh, don't tell your child that the animal's gone to heaven because that's just going to create more questions for them. Um, and we, we have a tendency to want to use these sort of like little white lies or easy fixes instead of actually getting into the tough, the tough stuff and it can do more damage for our, our healing than good. And finally, how to grieve yourself while you're simultaneously helping your child get through that process. And an example of that is in a lot of the books, um, especially the books about the death of a loved one, you, the images will actually show a parent crying. And so we, we discuss it's perfectly healthy. In fact, it's encouraged that you let your child see you cry and process your own emotions. However, if you're at a stage in your grief where you are crying uncontrollably or hysterically, that can be very scary for your child. And so try to reserve those moments for your private grieving and allow um, the gentle crying during your family grieving. Next, we have healing activities. So these are detailed instructions for a variety of art and play-based therapy activities that are paired with all the materials needed to engage on the spot. And so again, back to the design thinking piece, we knew that when we started this, no family who's going through a grieving process should have to then engage in research about what book do I read and what activity would be appropriate. And even if we were to just have a binder that we lent out to people, they would read this and maybe on the spot, it would be nice if they could engage, but now they have to go shopping for whatever we have here, you know, some journals or the right pair of scissors or a stapler or, oh, we don't have glue sticks because, you know, we're not a library or a daycare center. Um, so we decided that it would be most impactful if people could have access to the instructions and all the materials needed in order to engage on the spot. So this section is, is interesting. The acts of kindness um, are activities that we just discussed are for individuals who are experiencing their trauma and their grief, but we also developed this acts of kindness section for the next stage of their healing journey, specifically to engage them on a deeper level with the larger community that they're going to meet because of their trauma. So one example might be if you lost a loved one to cancer, there are walks or there are, you know, uh, ways to engage and make donations or make calls. But beyond that, not just national organizations, there are local people. So perhaps your loved one who had Alzheimer's um, was in an assisted living facility. And after their passing, the people that worked with them may also be 
grieving and could use some comfort. And so you can create a little uh, kindness gift basket to give to that person with you know, some tissues and throat lozenges, um, maybe some eye drops and chocolate, just a little thank you for helping my loved one. Uh, we're all in this together. And then finally, our community helpers section. Um, this has a wide variety of helpers that your child can turn to besides parents that are safe adults. Um, these are people that, in addition to, for example, school helpers that's shown here, your teachers and staff, but maybe also a school guidance counselor or a coach of a sports team they may be involved in. All of these are people that may be able to help your child in a way that a parent can't. But beyond that, these are also people that you may want to notify your child's going through something so they can understand um, behaviors that may arise, what's going on with your child. And this section I love because we encourage our librarians to actually bolster it with local organizations. So that could be pamphlets or one sheeters or business cards of the organizations that your library partners with in order to assist these families once they've returned the kit so that their journey can continue. Um, now, so the picture books, when we were reading hundreds and hundreds of books per kit to determine which created the best um, diverse set of experiences, we realized you, know, you can give the right book to anyone, but unless they have the ability to read it properly and maximize it, um, it, it may not go as far as it potentially could. So we created a, a discussion guide to go along with every single book that we've included. It has discussion prompts on a page by page basis, as well as observations that you may make about your child and what they're going through as you're reading this story together. And beyond that, there are also tie-ins back to the activities guide. So for example, if we are reading The Dead Bird by Margaret Wise Brown for our death of a pet kit, they have a little, um, ceremony to lay the bird to rest and so there's a reference back to an activity in that guide if you know if your child is resonating with this part of the book and you'd like to do something like this yourself please refer back to this activity and these are the books that we wound up chose, choosing um, so these are the death of a loved one titles um, and before i keep going i i mentioned diversity before and i hope everybody here is engaged with the we need diverse books movement but when we were building this out, we recognized that yes, there is you know, racial or religious diversity, but in addition, there's experiential diversity that's taking place when we're dealing with trauma. And so we had the challenge of trying to locate diverse books uh, with experiences, with representation of different peoples, um, and that were high quality enough that we would feel comfortable putting in the hands of our patrons experiencing trauma. So these are death of a loved one titles. These are the titles we chose for Alzheimer's and Your Family. And these are the titles that we landed on for The Death of a Pet. If anybody out there knows a good um, book about the death of a reptile or a snake or, or an amphibian, please share it with me because I didn't find anything. <laughs> and those are that, yeah, if you have any suggestions, type into the question section and, and let me know other titles that you might think would be good for, for some yeah. of these. Always yeah. looking for that. It's something uh, so, to think about. Some kids love those kind of to have those kind of pets, yeah, and they want to have something that they can relate to. Absolutely. And I, you know, I looked and I looked, and the other the other piece of that puzzle is: is it a high enough quality book? You know, is it something that was just slapped together so there could be a book about a snake out there, or is it something that's actually, um, you know, we we're we're really good at gauging what makes a a good high quality book. Um, so before I continue, I'm just wondering if anybody has questions about the contents of the kit or kits. Yeah, um, if you do type in also into the question section, let us know if you have anything you wanna know more about any of the, the parts that are in there. Um, and I'm just, I'll keep going. And if one does come through, Krista, just go ahead and interrupt me. Yes, I will. Oh, great. <laughs> So now on to the social emotional learning piece of what we've created. So what these kits do, I've talked about this a little, but what they do is supply families with an introduction to a healing plan of their own design through um, constructive discussion with or without books, sharing of stories, the participation in therapeutic activities, and encouraging families to continue healing after the kit has been returned within those resources of their community. Also, it allows you as a librarian to invest in the wellness of your community. What these kits do not do is take the place of a therapist or a social worker, guarantee a fix to what has happened, or turn you into a therapist. 
So CASEL um, is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Uh, they focus on making evidence-based social and emotional learning an integral component of learning for pre-K through high school. And they do this through research, practice, and policy. And I have their web address there for you. Um, I'm going to read this all out because it's, it's so good. So their definition of social emotional learning is social and emotional learning or SEL is the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. So I'm wondering, before we keep going, if anybody here is already familiar with CASEL or social emotional learning. If you want to throw a number one through five, and if you're a five, please let me know um, what other means to you. And actually, this one, I the polls uh, did get it set up into there in the GoToWebinar software, so. <laughs> oh, great. Um, I just launched that out there. So you should be able to check on one of those choices. I'm a school librarian and familiar, a public and familiar. I'm a school and unfamiliar, and I'm a public and unfamiliar or other. Um, so check in the um, boxes on the poll that's on your screen right now. And when um, everyone has answered, I'll share it with everybody. Um, well, we do have a, while well, while you guys are answering this, I do have a comment here that someone did um, post. Regarding reaching out to community helpers to alert them about the grieving family. If I understood correctly, what might the concerns be over a family's privacy? Oh, sure. I, I understand how I may have um, th put this out there in a confusing way. Instead of that, we're not talking about reaching out to an agency and um, sharing their contact information. Instead, you would be reaching out to that agency. Say it's... Um, um, a hospice organization, for example, um, letting them know that you have this kit that you will be lending to families and do they have resource materials they would give you to include in the kit that families then could take. So then the it's on the family to do the reaching out. It's not our responsibility as librarians. However, having said that, and I know I said I would get to this later, but it's again, too good an opportunity. Um, when the kit is returned, there's a section in the librarian guide that talks about sort of how to gracefully approach that reference interview situation. So there's an excellent chance that your family has more questions now that they've returned the kit. And it would be appropriate to say, you know, was there anything in here that you would like help with? Um, is there an organization you'd like me to tell you more about? Is there someone you wanted to reach out to that we can help you um, find information on? And so sort of turning it into a reference interview where you're assisting the patron, but also you allowing that local agency to know that you have these kits. Um, and if you have some sort of flyer you can give them, you can sort of you know help one another and scratch one another's backs and helping these families and being as available as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right. Anybody else still want to make uh, their choice here on the poll? I'm going to close it in five, four, three. Because <laughs> I can tell you haven't all voted, but all right, we'll close this and share for who did. Sure. There we go. Nobody is, from, is that well, nobody who's on the line with us right now is familiar. <laughs> okay. Great. And so some of them are public and are, and some are school and are unfamiliar. So we have a mixture of school and publics today. Okay. Okay. And I, this honestly is something that typically is the case as well. So yeah. I will, I will just brief this by saying that any of what we're about to discuss for social emotional learning, SEL, could easily, I mean, any one of these bullet points could be multiple webinars. So this is going to be sort of your quick crash course. Um, and I gave you that website so you could learn more and read more, or you can also go to my website for uh, a little more information too. So and I just want to jump in before you yeah. go on, um, Megan, uh, that you did for the answer you gave to the question about the privacy. Uh, the the question did say thank you for the great reply. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I love questions. Keep them coming, guys. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be your super quick. I don't feel like I get it completely because she rushed through that crash course. I apologize, you can always reach out to me or like I said, um, read what's available to get a deeper dive. But basically, CASEL breaks SEL into five categories of social emotional learning. First is self-management. Second is self-awareness. 
Third is social awareness. Fourth is relationship skills. And fifth is responsible decision making. And you can see that off to the right, uh, right hand side in that wheel. It's the center of that wheel, the five components, five categories. Next, if you look out, there are three rings around those five categories, classrooms, schools, and home and communities. So depending on what you answered before, if you're a school library, you would fit into that schools piece. You may also find that working closely with a teacher whose student has experienced a life-changing event or trauma, you may wind up in the classrooms realm. Uh, and then we public librarians would exist in the homes and communities realm. Or if you wind up working with, say, a hospice organization who decides to carry the library's kit for you, they would also be in that community realm. Now, this is all available on my website. I have a grant language section that lays this out, and I think it's even, it might even be more detailed than what I'm sharing with you here. But if you are interested in presenting this to the school board or a funding source or writing a grant, these can be really helpful ways to show how the Healing Library addresses these social emotional learning needs. So I'm gonna read through these, um, but again, pretty quickly. So in terms of self-management, um, the kits offer recognition of emotion through parent-led discussions in topics uh, covered in the discussion guide and in the book discussion guides. There's an opportunity for creating a channel for communication with parents or other safe adults through the discussion guides and technically the community helpers as well. And finally, there are experiences for coping provided in the activities guide. And so the I'll just mention that the bold pieces are the healing library terminology and the non-bold pieces are the CASEL terminology. So there's emotional identification and recognition through parent-led discussions using the topic guide and book discussion guide. Um, there's recognition of effective activities to reduce stress through the activities guide. And there are opportunities for self-reflection while sharing picture books together on a deeper, deeper level with parents. In terms of self-awareness, we address this through the recognition of experiences and how they relate to others through the curated selection of picture books and the parent guided discussions. And I believe I also mentioned this on the website, the acts of kindness and engaging with a deeper community is also covered here. Awareness of self adults, safe adults for children is reviewed in the parent led discussions and in the community helpers guide. And there are opportunities to show thanks and kindness to a variety of others in the acts of kindness guide. In terms of relationship skills, new emotional territory and language is created safely for families throughout all parts of the kit. A potential network of safe adults for children is reviewed in the discussion guides, the picture book discussion guides, and in the community helpers guide. And there's an opportunity to show kindness and give back to the greater community, again, discussed in the acts of kindness guide. And then finally, in our responsible decision-making uh, area, families are encouraged to keep all of the handouts in order to revisit them and continue their journey of healing. The community helpers guide focuses on local support systems to build a network of healers after this kit is returned. And that's nationally from what we've created and locally from the supplements that you provide. And finally, the acts of kindness guide encourages ways for a family to become involved with their network of caregivers during the period of trauma in meaningful ways. Now, I know that was a lot really quickly. Uh, <laughs> however, does anybody have a social emotional learning question about what we just reviewed? Hmm. Yeah, if you do have any questions, you want to um, dive deeper into any of those areas, you can uh, let us know, ask. Um, we can definitely do that. We have um, plenty of time today to do a little bit. I know you yeah. said each of those could be their own session, and maybe that'll be something yeah. in the future. <laughs> and I'm just going to let that sort of stew for people, too. And again, mm -hmm. if it pops up, you know, as we get into this next section, um, just throw it out there and we'll address it. Yeah, yeah. Type so, in whenever you think of anything and I will grab it and, and we can discuss it, no problem. Brilliant. Uh, uh -huh. We're gonna dive into how you can actually get started in lending these now and what that looks like. So our, our website is thehealinglibraryus.com and we truly wanted to make this as simple as possible. We don't collect information. Um, it's purely opt-in if you do want us uh, to add you to our mailing list or something. So in order to get our free downloads, you would visit our website. You can click the section that says free downloads, and then you'll see this is the, what that web page looks like. The underlying titles of anything, you can click and it will automatically save as a PDF to your computer. 
from there, you would want to explore the PDF that you just downloaded, and then you'd have to you know, go out in nature or I suppose on Amazon or whatever it is that you do to shop for the components you'd like to include in your kit, and then you would assemble your kit. Now, um, one of the things Krista and I talked about when, when we were discussing this is that we wanted to focus this more on a rural or small library um, audience. And so I included this page because a lot of the conversations that I've had with um, my rural and small librarians who are interested in the kits always went sort of like this. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. We have to have this at my library, but I don't have the manpower to assemble this. We are constantly on desk all day and I cannot imagine how long it would take and how I'm gonna put this thing together. So where can I buy it? And at the time, you know, I designed this to just be a free thing that we would create these pieces, we'd throw it out there to un the universe, wipe our hands and just like feel good about what we had done. And so it, of course, you know, plan and it doesn't work out. So I decided, um, I left my library in Chattanooga after my son was born, um, about this time ago last year actually, and I decided, okay, this is the time in my life when I can commit to creating some for sale items for our small and rural libraries. So alternatively, if you know your staffing is a problem, or I tell people too that if you are planning on building out your own kit, it is easy, but if you're like me and you're really into design thinking and you're really into user-based design, you're gonna create these things. And I would expect to spend about 30, 30 to 40 hours per kit um, between researching the correct materials, um, purchasing things, you know, cost alternatives. Um, mm -hmm. If you're writing a grant, that's time you know, time as well to get the funds to create your own. Um, so I'd expect 30 to 40, 40 hours each. And so you can take that number and multiply it by your hourly rate. Then you can add to that the cost of your materials and that is the cost of your kit. If that doesn't work for you, um, we, did a, we did create them available for purchase. And because I was so focused on the different sizes of libraries out there, the different uh, barriers that people are interested in creating or reducing when it comes to borrowing a kit such as this, I made three different sizes. And so our small kit um, comes in a clear plastic handle, a clear plastic case with a handle and some back hinges, high quality stuff. And it contains two books of your choice and two small activities, the, the two small activities for that kit. Um, the medium size comes in an embroidered L.L. Bean tote bag. That one has three books inside, two small activities, and your choice of one large activity. And then finally, the large size that we have is an embroidered L.L. Bean rolling duffel bag, and that has every book and every activity that we designed for the kit inside. Um, next, you would add it to your catalog. And again, this is such a personal thing. You know, some, some libraries where I've worked, they wanted every piece detailed and you know what color is it where did you purchase it how much does it cost uh if it's damaged what would it cost to replace it um other libraries are like this is just you know this clear plastic kit component is the charm art piece of the death of a pet kit it cost us about 15 bucks to put together and that's all we're going to say about it other places I've worked would say it as a whole is one entity and let's not go through all that work. We're just gonna add it to the catalog as one listing. I will say that if you're curious about how people have done that, um, there are a lot of libraries that are carrying these now and you can take a look in their catalogs to see what kind of information did they write down about this? Or I'm sure you could reach out to them and ask, how did you catalog this previously? And then finally, the, I'll, I will say that six, seven, and eight are sort of interchangeable. So you might just be so excited that you're done and you're ready to go that you start lending your kit. And another thing about the, the um, cataloging of these kits as well is, I mean, many of it, it like typical things in the library there, they check out and they return. But the um, materials for the activities are going to yeah. be used up potentially. So that's something else you have to think of as well if, you know, yeah. Some of these kids, I'm looking at them on the page right now, you know, like the death of a pet one, there's um, doing art with charms, embroidery floss and and um, seeds and things, and those are not going to come back. So that's something, too, that um, you're going to have to think of as a library is like, how do you indicate that, that it's something that doesn't come back? And then 
restocking that part of the kit when the rest of it comes back. Yeah, what we've what we found that libraries are doing is as I'm talking to people that are building these out or purchasing them and lending them and be it schools or public libraries, I will say. So folks are they tend to assign somebody to sort of be the caretaker of the kit or maybe a couple people from a department if you're if you're that size that could have like two chil children's department people who take care of this. And so those people would when the kit is returned, they would review it. And in that librarian guide that I mentioned are restocking instructions. So every activity that's there, there's a printed list of here's what should be in this. And so you know if it's not, ah, time to put more embroidery floss in, or oh, we're out of staples, better refill that box. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great, great point. Um, so then the I'm not sure if you'd want to do number seven before number six, but you should share the news with your local professional professionals, and that's your public school, your private schools, child, child care centers or daycare centers, health specialists, funeral homes, humane societies, assisted living facilities, hospice organizations. It really depends on which kit you've decided to start lending and what's available local that makes your community special. But those people should know about what you're doing, and you really should have some sort of flyer or handout or brochure or business card that they could give out to their clientele to encourage them to borrow your kits as well. Um, so whatever you do, number six or number seven first, um, then you'd want to do number eight and just share the news with us. I love the the stories that I'm getting back from people about how this has impacted their community. Actually, one of one of my favorites right now is Napa County, California. You may remember a few years ago they experienced um, some terrible earthquakes, and then oh, I'm sorry, a terrible earthquake, and then uh, multiple fires and it was completely devastating for the community. Um, and when I've talked to their children's department, they started lending the kits and they actually reshaped part of part of it to deal with the death of a loved one specific to, I believe they broke it into mother, father, grandmother, grandfather. Um, and what they found was it was so popular that in addition to lending the kit, they had to purchase more of the books that they were lending within the kits because the kit would be checked out or the kits would be checked out. And then they could say to people, well, let's print you off the pieces you need from this free PDF and we carry extras of the books. So they were sort of cobbling together these makeshift kits um, and word began to spread and they've just become more and more popular. So if you do decide to assemble your own, um, I share these pictures because this was this was the sort of beta test. When we first launched these in October of 2017, this is what the kits looked like. And so I just, I was presenting at a conference and I just went to like Target and found the hard plastic cases inside. And I was at another store that actually had three of the same kind of suitcase available. And I just purchased all three of them. Um, and then I had two binders, one was for the librarian guide and one was for the family materials. Um, so this is just to show you another way that things could be put together. However, if you do decide to assemble your own, I have two suggestions. And the first is to consider diversity, experiential and reflective of your community. Uh, potentially, if, you, if you've done a diversity audit, you're in really great shape, uh, but you can look through the list of books that we have and pick and choose the ones that work for your audience. And then second is to really consider design thinking. And so you can see I've separated all of the play and th um, art and play-based therapy activities into individual cases, but they're different sizes and they have different openings. Um, so really what's gonna work for your audience? And again, consider the diversity of the experiences that you're lending within these kits in the activities section. Um, for example, uh, there's one that has to do specifically with anger, and it's an emotion that typically is brushed under the rug when it comes to the grieving process. But for a child, well, truly for anyone, understanding our anger and how to experience it in a healthy way and move forward from that um, doesn't mean, you know, allowing a child simply to fill with rage and, and leave it there. So allowing a child to participate in an activity that has to do with anger, and then allowing perhaps a more introspective journaling activity sort of covers a spectrum of experiences. Okay, now Bonnie says, we had a few conversations about this, but I was like, well, she's like, well, how long do libraries lend things for? And I said, well, it's different everywhere. And in my experience, when it comes to non-traditional lending, um, that it gets even weirder, right? So some things will go out for one night, other things will go out for two months, 
um, so what do you think, Bonnie? And she said, I wouldn't feel comfortable with these kits going out for less than two weeks, but really I think a four week lending period would allow a family to experience this and then even more importantly, get comfortable with it and get to engage with it in a different way as they're going through this grieving process together. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm gonna launch right into this. Uh, and if you, while I'm talking, if you have a concern of your own or another solution for what I'm talking about, I hope you will please chime in and, and let me know or let us know. Yeah, yeah. So please type into the question section as you're thinking of things that relate to these kits and how you might use them in your library. Or if you have used these kind of things in your library, let yeah. us know any successes or failures. Yes, please. To learn from. Um, especially, especially the quirky things. When I worked at my small library, you know, we'd you'd go to conferences, and I used to joke that um, <laughs> for those of us working in small libraries, I mean, when I was in Vermont, we had one room libraries, we had one man libraries, and oh, yeah. we have that yeah, here. so so yeah. totally normal things that when I was building these out, I was trying to create something that was flexible, and so one size doesn't fit all. Um, we're different. We have varying problems, but that also means we have really creative solutions. So one of the biggest problems I hear from people has to do with storage space. So my solution was for those that have to purchase, for example, the rolling duffel obviously is one size. A tote bag is different. It can be hung up. It can be stowed on a shelf or in a cabinet. Um, or the plastic case can actually be stored with your library materials on the shelf um, because that may work. You may not have outback space. I mean, so many of us don't. Uh, but beyond that, think about what works for you. A backpack, something that you could hang from the ceiling or um, empty to put things away. A big binder could also work. Collapsible milk crates. Uh, in Chattanooga, we had um, the outreach people. One of my favorite outreach pe per persons, she had a collapsible milk crate that was her solution to getting things ready because she could fold it up and store it under her desk but then when she was ready to fill it, it popped up and it had rolling wheels. And so it was really easy for her to get around with. Um, a gym bag or even one of those sort of super flat squat under the bed rolling tote type of things. Um, we talked about the difficulty of replenishing materials before. So you can completely just raid your supply closet. You could create a community accessible Amazon wish list. When I was in Vermont, the my book budget was so small that you know, you have those dream titles that come out, but you just can't justify buying it. And so once a year we would have, um, we would print out these titles and hang them on a tree and folks could come up and make a donation to the library and purchase that title. And we put a little book plate in there thanking them. So something like that could work with a supply drive. In addition, if you did have partner agencies you were working with, you could potentially also put out boxes for your supply drive at their location if you wanted to do it in a physical way. Uh, posters asking for donations. I don't know about you, but my community in Vermont, when I posted one, you know, eight and a half by 11 inch paper printed poster asking for Legos, <laughs> I got tens of thousands of Legos from local grandparents who, you know, the grandkids had even outgrown them now, but nobody throws those things away. And I think we kind of have a tendency to do that with art supplies too. Um, yes, I see lots of libraries posting on their Facebook pages that um, we're planning, you know, like months ahead, we're planning for this summer's summer reading program or this event coming up and we're looking for, you know, milk bottles or whatever. Yeah. And um, that's how, yeah, you get a lot of these things. And this would be the same thing for this, see what's in the kits and then ask for those kind of materials to be donated. Absolutely, exactly, exactly that. Um, grants and in fact, micro grants, which in my understanding is $500 or less, $500 could stock these kits for a very long time. And then finally, you could consider sponsorships. So maybe there is a local organization or hospital or university that has work similar to the work that you're, you lending these kits is giving your community who would want to sponsor a particular component or kit itself and would be willing to, you know, biannually or quarterly restock those supplies for you. For grants, I was going to say, yeah, definitely look for anything that is for youth. I mean, here in Nebraska, we do yeah. have the Library Commission Youth Grants for Excellence, which um, we just announced our ones for 2020 that were um, awarded, <laughs> but coming up in the fall, fall again, it's like August or so, we'll be announcing them again. So look for any local grants that are specific, because this is specifically being geared towards children. 
and youth, yeah. um, that would be a kind of grant that you could definitely get um, received for this um, to, to purchase the kits to begin with, the ones that you have on your website, and then yeah. for the ongoing maintenance of them. And I will say, um, I worked with a, a librarian recently out of Montana, and I helped her writing her grant, and she was, and she had all of the questions that all of us do, right? Like, how they're gonna ask me, how come I just don't build myself, build the kit myself instead of purchasing one? And so we talked about, you know, we actually did a mathematical exercise with her hourly rate of pay, as I mentioned, and times 30 to 40 hours, adding in the, the cost of the materials. Um, oh, where was I going with this? Oh, it's gone. What to put into the grant to explain why you didn't just do it yourself. <laughs> oh, right, and so we, she also asked, um, or she didn't ask, but she was sort of skirting around it. Like, she was like, I just don't know how to say that I don't want to give them used crayons. And I was like, um. oh, I know what you mean. I was, so we have this thing called value, um, perceived value. And it's, it's, and I know librarians will get this because we fight against it all the time. Our programs are quote unquote free. And so they, it is assumed that it won't be as good as the summer camp you have to pay for, or the after school program you have to pay for, or you know fill in the blank, anything you have to pay for. And one of the things that say purchasing all new materials for a kit or purchasing a completed kit shows these families is that there's a level of respect for the life changing event that you've gone through and we want to give you the best possible experience moving forward, you, you deserve it. Um, so I would I would only throw that out there that you know there's something special to a child about opening even if it is just a brand new box of crayons. Mm -hmm. It feels different than you know oh 35 of these 40 crayons are brown. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you're in one of these traumatic stages in your life to begin with. Yeah. That, that little yeah, not that, it's not just we want to give new crayons to the kids. It's the right. children who are who are struggling and suffering with some uh, traumatic event that happened in their life. Yeah, that your experience is not an afterthought, that yeah. we intentionally designed something for you that is special. Uh, okay, off that soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another solution that I get a lot when I'm talking to people face to face is, okay, so I like the idea of say that big binder that I could shelve instead of the hard plastic case, but I can't put hard plastic cases of activities inside a binder, what do I do? And so I say, oh, you know, zippered pouches, like pencil pouches are a great solution. Um, if you're doing something that's say not a binder, sturdy Ziploc containers, or even um, like those, the nice deli meats that you get that come in the plastic containers that are kind of flat, those can work well. Um, hard pencil cases can be a lifesaver because they're long and skinny and sort of squat travel size containers like um, for, I always think of like the travel area at Target, for example, with the little tiny pill containers or the fill your own lotion containers, those might be able to house what you're doing. And even things like spice jars could be a good solution. I have this dream about making like those giant pretzel kegs, making those into kits somehow. And I wanna use all the weird containers inside because I think it would be so entertaining to open up as a user. Um, and then the no staff time, we, we touched on this before, so I'm not going to uh, dive too deep into this. I will just mention that the separation and divorce kit is the only kit that comes in kind of one size. If you were to build your own out, um, you would obviously create whatever you want, but that kit was specifically designed around one single title, which is the exception to the rule for what we do. Um, and in that book, it's beautiful. It's called Here and There. It's by Tamara Ellis Smith and Evelyn Dabiti. Uh, Ivan is the main character and he's from a mixed race family that is experiencing, you can't tell in the moment if it's a separation or a divorce, but Ivan is traveling in between these two homes, the home that he grew up in and his father's new apartment. Um, and so we really wanted that kit to sort of singularly encompass his experience. Um, so it comes in a backpack that looks just like Ivan's and there's a ukulele inside because you know his dad plays the guitar and music is sort of what wakes him up to things can be the same no matter where you are. Um, anyway, I again, I'll get off the Ivan soapbox, which I love as well. But there is grant language on the website. And speaking of grants, there are a few national or um, thematically appropriate grants that you might also consider. And if you are going that route, the, you know, the healing, the wellness card um, tends to be really popular right now. 
Um, so that that could be a good angle or hook for you. And then finally, like I said, I helped you know Montana most recently write a grant where they got three kits that she's actually working as a school librarian with the the school guidance counselor, and they're working in tandem to lend these kits. Um, so I'm happy to you know help you work through some of your language, or if you did want to go through that the cost exercise with me, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that stuff. Um, finally, if you do decide to create your own kit on your own topic, which people have done, uh, like I said, we we have willingly shared our logos, our fonts, and any of the contents can be replicated on any of the to any topic of your choice. But what's not included is your time. And I will say that for my team, and we've done this before, when we create a new kit, it takes about 150 hours uh, and your own crack team, but take it seriously and responsibly. The highest recommendation I can give you is to get your own body, whether it's a licensed clinical social worker, whether it's a mental health specialist that deals with children or families, but engaging a body in your project ensures an ethical and moral responsibility to the content that you're creating so that you can give people something that's not just, we think this is the right thing, but that's actually been vetted by a, a mental health professional. Um, or we, you can actually contract our team to co work with you to create a kit. I know something that when, when you, um, I, you put through the, uh, this proposal to do this uh, session here, um, one thing that I thought of was um, that it was um, potentially could resonate with people here in Nebraska and in the Midwest in general. Um, and I thought about that when you mentioned the, the fires, uh, the flooding yeah. that happened here last year. Yes. Um, the whole middle, I mean, we had cities that were completely flooded out, destroyed um, the schools, their homes, the library, luckily for our, our public libraries, came out in Nebraska at least pretty well. They seem to be built in well high areas, oh, good. Um, but that that would be potentially a good um, topic for one of these because you know there are kids out there who are um, struggling with what just happened in my community. Everything is underwater. My toys, my everything is gone. Um, yeah. Well, and, and so we, it's so, it's so difficult. And it's coming because, again this year, they're saying, with the snow, with the melt and everything, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to, maybe we're not sure yet as bad, but <clears throat> it's going to come back. And there are still some places recovering. Some roads are still out. I mean, it's, that that would be a good topic for one of these kinds of kits, definitely. Yeah, and, and, and so just as a, um, an opportunity for folks to create something localized like that about natural disaster, because mm -hmm. we talked about natural disasters as, as an overall kit, and we decided it wouldn't be appropriate to do one that was all encompassing. You know, there should be something about losing a home to fire. There should be something about wildfires in community. And so maybe fire could be one, but flooding is completely different. Earthquakes are completely different. Right. Um, so we, we knew that we couldn't do it justice in one kit. Uh, but what I would suggest is if anybody listening uh, would like to create a flooding kit, perhaps they have a title that they really love, share it in, in the, the group chat or with everybody or you know share it with you, Krista. And I would look through some of the materials that we've already created and see if there's something that is on track with that. So you could just sort of take one art and play-based therapy activity, print the instructions, create the materials, and lend that one activity with that one book even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so type in some ideas that you do have. And I was just I was just trying to look here. We actually, there is a local thing that has been done here in Nebraska. Um, and we did a session on it last year because it was during the um, the flooding. Uh, the let's see, University of Nebraska Lincoln, the Nebraska Extension. Um, they have a learning child um, uh, team, and they came up with a Read for Resilience program um, oh, supporting young children's coping with storybooks, which sounds very similar to what you guys yeah. are doing, which I thought was very cool. And um, because it's very locally and specific to Nebraska because of what was happening here, and it's specifically to deal with a natural disaster. Experiencing oh, a natural disaster can be very stressful for young children. And the kind of books they came up with, and I'm just looking at it here, and I can share it to everyone too. Um, I guess they, they may have, maybe have had the same trouble. There's not necessarily a book about what to do when my home's been flooded. <laughs> yeah. But there are things about 
um, struggling and just coping with um, one time I was scared. A terrible thing happened is one of the books. Um, how I feel about something. Um, yeah. So things are more not necessarily specific to the event that happened because, like you said, it's going to vary from um, situation to situation. But a bad thing happened and what can I do in general to deal with a bad thing? There was a book that I loved when I was working in Maine. We had a series of thunderstorms that came through and um, lit many houses on fire over the course of a week. It was this terrible storm. Uh, and I, I'm going to get the title wrong because I look for it every, I feel like every few weeks. It's probably every few months. But it was called something like After the Storm. And it mm -hmm. was about a child's experience after a storm had passed that was frightening to them and sort of how, how they comforted themselves. Um, as a family or how this family comforted the child. And years later, um, Vermont had, a, Hurricane Irene hit Vermont and the community I had been living in and working in had terrible floods that um, took lives and lives of children, destroyed small businesses and um, uh, farms, you know, family homesteads, and even up in the mountains because of the amount of rain that fell. Uh, these kids, every I remember talking to my friends and they were like, I don't know what to tell my child. Every time she sees that it's going to rain in the forecast, she asks, you know, are we going to lose our chickens? Are we, are we going to, yeah. is our home going to yeah. make it? Um, and so that I, I love that they've created that for Nebraska specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if I'm the one after the storm, it's a Percy, the park keeper book by Nick Butterworth. Ooh, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> oh, that's when I found it. I just typed in after the storm children's book. Um, a storm is raging outside. Um, the old oak tree has been blown down and it's a disaster for his animal friends. So they're trying to figure out what to do. Oh, see, this isn't, mine was a picture book, but I'm going to check this one out. Well, too. this is a picture book. Yes, it is. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a picture book. And you yeah. said Butterworth? Yeah, Nick Butterworth. That's the one that I found. Um, right. I'll look at that after. And if that's the one, I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll keep it open here. And I'll show you the screen. Yeah. Cool. Um, we do have some comments coming through. I want to get um, what the audience has been talking about yes. here. Um, well, you're asking for ideas. Um, bullying, mm. definitely mm -hmm. huge topic. And um, specifically, we're talking about um, uh, natural disasters. And uh, of course, here in, in Nebraska, in the Midwest, and what's just happened there in Nashville, uh, yeah. someone said we've had tornado to tragedies, tr tornado tragedies here. Yeah. So specifically yeah. tornadoes and actually um just this morning when we were um at about 10 15 10 or 15 every wednesday morning here in lincoln where i am we have our tornado sirens are tested and i'm not sure if anyone yeah. heard but i was it was at one point it happened this morning because we were 10 we started so at 10 o'clock so at 10 15 the sirens started going on out on off outside my window <laughs> And I hope nobody heard it too much. I was trying to mute my microphone as much as I could. It happened to be at a time when we were chatting about something in the show. Yeah. But um, every week there's this reminder, there's sirens set up just in case. Yeah, we have, we have sirens on the mountain where I live and my husband and I are from the Northeast. And I remember for the longest time, we were like, what is that thing? That is the weirdest cell tower I've ever seen. And uh, somebody he works with told us, you know, no dummy, that's, <laughs> that's not what that is. Um, and luckily, I've never heard it go off. Uh, yeah. But so beyond, um, if anybody has anything there uh, that they want to share for other topics, yeah. bullying is a big one. Of suggestions. Oh. Yeah, a kit on homelessness due to yes. poverty and a kit on abusive families that split up would be helpful. Ooh, that is yeah. thick and tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what mm -hmm. I do is mm -hmm. I keep a list of all these suggestions that folks make to me, whether it's in conversations or through a webinar or just in passing. Um, and I keep, I keep an overall list. And I will say that bullying is one of the, the biggest topics. And so I can't tell you who, but I've been um, like Twitter harassing this author that I love about <laughs> um, hiring our team so that we can create a kit around her upcoming title that would deal with bullying and it would be our first foray into middle grade fiction because thus far we've we've stuck with picture books because they're so accessible um mm -hmm. but getting into the middle grade fiction and and teenage fiction as well is something that we we have been wanting to tackle um, but if anybody wants to get a hold of me or has questions um i've got all my information here um and 
it it looks fancy, the healing library us at gmail.com, but really that's me. So <laughs> if you if you Your direct send, connection to yeah. yeah. If you send us an email, I'm I'm the, you know, it's gonna come to me. Okay. All right, so um, we're a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, just a couple other comments that people had here that I want to share. When you were earlier, we were asking about what people do in their libraries, potentially. Um, so people yeah. said that you lend out blood pressure kits, partnering with their health department. I um, love that. Something else. And board games, of course. That's a thing that libraries are doing a lot. I love that, yeah. That help with things. Um, and then someone else just commented they had to leave. Oh. Um, they had to be on the desk, oh. but... Um, <laughs> She's in the University of, Muse of Missouri Columbia program, and she's going to be sharing the info with the, um, the university today. Uh, oh, sharing, the, sharing the generous info you shared today. Thank you. Oh. And they have a C4CH program, Catalyst for Community Health program, that she's involved in, and so she's going to try and share it with them. Great. And if they wind up listening, um, feel free to reach out with any questions, thehealinglibraryus at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the recording will be up there and anyone who wants to can yeah, share it to other groups and organizations. So anybody have any other desperate last minute questions you want to ask of Megan right now or suggestions? Um, type them in. Otherwise, you know, you got all the contact information, information you'll be able to reach her there. Um, while we're waiting to see, I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen so I can show you some of the things we had here. So there's this is just the session page for today. Um, and the Healing Library page um, that we do, as you can see here from our, this is this page for this, um, the event, and we're gonna link here to the Healing Library page, which when the recording goes up, this information will be included as well, so you have all that info. Um, and this is just what their website looks like, their shop, uh, the downloads, everything here. This is the program I was talking about that the uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln has, Read for Resilience, Supporting Young Children's Coping with Storybooks. Um, we did do a previous Encompass Live about this, so if you look into our archives for Read for Resilience, you will find the recording of this. Um, but this has got all their info, and they have storybook guides that go along with each of the books that they have um, here, and they provide the books to you, so you can request them here. Oh, that's awesome. These are the different titles about, you know, being worried about something. Here's a book for children who have experienced trauma. So these are more like um, I was saying, these are more general about just having bad things happen, not about a specific thing that happened. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the after the storm I found. Is that the right one? That is not it. Oh, oh another one. All right. <laughs> I just have to, you know, I just have to suck it up and be a real librarian. And <laughs> Person on the other side of the desk that's like, I think it was like 10 years ago. I read it. I feel like there's a cloud on the cover. <laughs> you know, I just have to like talk to myself like I would talk to a patron and give give my and you should be able to request a little more care and a little more <laughs> librarianship. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it doesn't look any questions coming. Uh, just a comment. Someone says no questions, but they do hope she can find contact that author and add bullying to the list. So another, uh, another yes. one about that yeah that might be your next project <laughs> I know I've, I've got a I've got a poker again today <laughs> yeah, absolutely all right so um, I think that is good if nobody has any other questions um, this is great like I said when um, this is one out of and many of you um, last Friday was our big talk from small libraries online conference and um, this is a session that uh, Megan originally present uh, submitted to that as a proposal and that's how I learned about it. But we always have more proposals that we can fit into one day. So I end up offering them up to come on Encompass Live and still get that information out there. So you see a lot of our follow-up shows after Big Talk happen to be all, you know, originally came out of, um, uh, for Encompass Live come out of Big Talk and Small Libraries proposals. And that's where this one came from. And I really did like the you know what you do there. And like I said, you know, the things that we have going on here with uh, the flooding and it just kind of caught my attention. So yeah. um, I was thrilled to have you on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I feel like you know, any chance I get to talk to like my root people of small and rural libraries is just a blessing for me because I love you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's you have you have a right nice wide ranging um experience too. This, which is good to hear that you know, 
these these kids you're putting together are any library could use these really there's not yeah, yeah. and having Thank the, the pre-made kits available like you said very very going to be very very helpful to the small libraries that we have yeah especially because the way we did it you know you you if even if you're purchasing a kit you're essentially still designing it for what your community needs and we'll go through some you know readers advisors readers advisory bibliotherapy with you <laughs> Like here's, I, I was looking at the one here. Yeah, there's a choice. You choose um, which book titles you want to include, and which. Yeah. So you yeah, still actually, get to choose what's the, in there. The lady uh, in Montana, we had, um, we probably spent, you know, not all, but we probably spent one day, just really talking about the implications that each book she was considering might have, and how we were going to build the most diverse kit that was reflective of her community. And I just I, I love this work and I love that I love that I get to work with people who care as much as I do, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Um I right, just last thanks for this great overview of the kits. Some comment someone's commenting. I'm looking forward to having these as an option in my collection development. So awesome. Oh awesome. Yeah, reach out if you want anything. Yeah. All right. So I think we will wrap it up for today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Megan, for joining us today. I apologize for the technical issues and weirdness we had with today's session. It doesn't usually go this way. Um, <laughs> as long as the Russian spammers stay away, we're usually good. <laughs> this is the second time in the history of the show that that's happened, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Future. So um, that will wrap it up today. I'm going to pop back to our Encompass Live page. And actually, um, if you use whatever your search engine of choice is and just search for Encompass Live online, so far nothing else is called that. Nobody else is allowed to use that name. It will come up on our web page as your first result no matter where you um, look. We've got our upcoming shows listed that we've scheduled. Um, but both, both but both beneath that is the archived shows. This is where all our archives are. Today's will be at the top of this list. Um, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube, where we post them, cooperate, they will be um, they will be um, done by the end of the day today. Everybody who attended today or pre-registered will get an email from me letting you know, and then we will push it out to our usual communication um, places, our mailing list, Facebook, Twitter, all the usual. Um, I'll show you here, while we're also here, we have a search feature. We can search our archives. Like I said, you can search for that um, resilience, if you can spell it correctly. Yes, I did. Um, and there is the, I try, it took me like three tries earlier to find it. <laughs> this is the recording of when we did that previous show on that, if you wanted to watch that or see their presentation. Um, we do have, we can search our entire archive or just the most recent 12 months if you want to. That is because this is our full archive of every show we've done in Encompass Live. Our first show was January 2009. Uh, so 10 years worth of recordings are here on this page. It's a long, long, long page. So do pay attention if you do do a search and watch the previous show. Just look at the date when it was originally broadcast. Uh, some things may be old, outdated information, services or products may have changed, web pages or links may no, may no longer work, um, but just pay attention to when you are watching it. Some things are eternally useful, but some things will, you know, but we are librarians. This is what we do. We archive and keep things for historical purposes, and we'll always have them available out there for you. Uh, as, do, as I kind of mentioned before, we do have a Facebook page. We'll link to that for Encompass Live, where we post reminders. So if you like to use Facebook, give us a like over here. Over here. Here's a reminder to log in today's show. When our recording is available and ready to go up, it will be on here as well. So if you do like to use Facebook to keep up with things, um, give us a like over there. Um, you will notice I normally at this point say, I hope you'll join us for next week's show. And as you can see, we do not have anything on the schedule yet. I am right in the midst of working on confirming something for um, the next couple of weeks shows. So um, keep your eyes and ears open for posts on our Twitter and Facebook uh, and on the web page to see what will be posted there. I'm hoping within the next today or tomorrow I should have something official and be able to put it up there for um, the 11th. But there's our other upcoming shows. And as I do get things confirmed and put on there, you'll see the schedule get filled up as well. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Thank you, Megan, for joining us. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I hope you'll um, see you on another future Encompass Live. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Bye-bye. Thanks.